Good afternoon. I have no title slide, but I am John Seward, if you're following along in your program. And instead of a title slide, I have a slide of a space, which is what I want to talk about in my paper entitled Interior Motives, Whistler's Studio, and Symbolist Mythmaking. I had the very real pleasure a number of years ago, which seems like another lifetime by now, of being a Smithsonian pre-doctoral fellow here at the Freer when I worked under the supervision of Dr. Linda Merrill and also got to know a fellow fellow, Lee Glazer, both of whom have become very dear friends. And for me to come back and see them again here at the Freer feels very much like a homecoming. I never got to speak in the Meyer Auditorium in any of that time, so it's a double pleasure to have that opportunity now. The promotional materials for this symposium state that we're gathered here to explore where to place the art of Whistler within the aesthetic movement. In this paper, I will be dealing with that idea of place in a doubled sense of the word. In the literal sense, I'm interested here in questions about the artist's studio as place. And here I show a photograph from the 1990s of Whistler's Paris studio on the Rue Notre-Dame-des-Champs in the 6th arrondissement, where he worked for several periods in the 1890s. And in what I say here this afternoon, I also want to suggest some implications that this particular place might have for placing Whistler within aestheticism and the larger modernist narrative. A number of photographs, which I'm sure to an audience like this are very familiar, a number of archival photographs document Whistler's Paris Atelier and his presence there. But Whistler himself left us with very few pictures of his studio. Here's one, which is currently in the exhibition uh, just beyond the auditorium, uh, a pen and ink drawing of 1856 in which a contemplative, disheveled figure, no doubt meant to be taken as Whistler, sits among the clutter of bohemian life in a Latin Quarter garret. And here's another, a painting now in the Art Institute of Chicago from around 1865 or 1866, depicting a more unmistakable Whistler, more elegant and confident at his easel, and accompanied by models in a fashionable London space appointed with the signs of success and the elevated taste that was being shaped into that something called aestheticism. A collection of blue and white china, a Japanese fan held by one of the women, what appear to be Japanese scroll paintings hanging on the back wall, and a framed print, probably one of Whistler's own etchings, at the far right. With its prominent mirror, the composition clearly looks to the influence of Velasquez Las Meninas, a picture that makes its own claims about the studio and the relationship of the artist to a wider public. Whistler's painting was intended as a study for a larger, never realized picture that was to have included his colleagues Henri Fantin Latour and the English painter Albert Moore, a summation of sorts of Whistler's creative self-conception at the time. As such, this painting is a sketch, a fragment of a bigger project. Now here's a fragment of another sort, an image that also derives from the situation of Whistler in his studio, although in less obvious ways. This photograph on the left is in effect an artifact of a visit to Whistler's studio in Paris at an undetermined moment during the later 1890s, most probably. It was made by the French art critic and poet Julien Leclerc. It appears in an idiosyncratic book, probably published sometime around 1900. It bears no publication date entitled Le Caractère et le Main, 
Character and the Hand. In it, Leclerc photographically documented and analyzed the hands of 30 well-known personalities of the day, celebrities such as the statesman and writer Georges Clemenceau, the author Emile Zola, artists including the sculptors Auguste Rodin and Jules Dalou, and it also includes the painter James McNeil Whistler. I'll have more to say about this particular hand in a moment. Julien Leclerc was an early champion of Vincent van Gogh. He was a close friend of Paul Gauguin. One contemporary called him Gauguin's shadow. He frequently contributed to the influential journal, the Mercure de France. In fact, he was a co-founder of that influential uh, vehicle of criticism. He was a poet on the periphery of the Stéphane Mallarmé circle that included Whistler himself. And so he brings us fully into the generation of symbolist writers whose words about Whistler repeatedly seek to construct a literary equivalent for the reserve and refinement they admired in his art. In 1889, for instance, the French novelist and critic Joris Carl Wiesmont published his volume titled Certain, a collection of critical essays about contemporary artists that looks at Whistler's landscapes and portraits and concludes with this, and I'm quoting Wiesmont here. And that will be his glory, as it will be that of others who shall have scorned public taste, to have aristocratically practiced an art resistant to common ideas, which effaced itself before the crowd a resolutely solitary, haughtily secret art. Huizman's statement here is consistent with the profile of the other artist he writes significantly about in Certain, among other artists to be sure, Edgar Degas. And in Certain, Huizman characterizes each of the artists he focuses on in terms of retreat, interiority, and interiorized sensation, to quote the Degas scholar Carol Armstrong. As she notes, Wiesman saw in the imagery of Degas' 1886 exhibition of bathers, two of which I'm showing you here, bathers turned away from the viewer, a repudiation of the public that amounted to, in Wiesman's words, an insulting adieu. And Wiesman identified the privacy and disdain he wanted to see in Whistler's art with that artist's own refusal, refusal to show his works in France since 1867, although to make this point, Wiesmann takes considerable liberty with the facts. But Wiesmann then takes up his tale again in 1882 when he says, Whistler's dark, mysterious canvases began to materialize once more in Paris exhibitions, including the Nocturne now in the collection of the Yale Center for British Art which was shown at the Petit Gallery in 1883. Nor was Wiesmont alone in emphasizing an essentially private, sequestered Whistler in writing about him during the roughly 10 years on either side of 1900. Jacques Emile Blanche, the French painter and essayist, saw Whistler as, quoting, a sort of Mallarmé of painting a visionary classified between Poe and Metterlanck, a black sorcerer shut up in his ebony tower in the midst of a garden of dark poppies in which the sun never warms the icy atmosphere. And that's a slightly sinister picture that always makes me think of Giovanni Boldini's portrait of Whistler. Here then are the essential ingredients for a symbolist picture of Whistler the comparison to poets of mystery, the allusions to decadence and black magic, a secluded tower of ebony, not ivory, and various other richly textured references to darkness and secrecy. In short, this passage from Blanche is virtually a primer of tendencies followed in several other end of century texts I want to consider, all of which share Whistler's studio for their setting whether that space was in Paris or London 
In each case, the author claims that the experience of seeing the artist and his work in his own milieu brings about a new understanding of the relationship between Whistler and his art that the writer presents to his readers. I can offer only a sampling of the many symbolist era descriptions of Whistler's studio that perpetuate the kind of rhetoric that we've already heard from Wiesmal and Blanche. This, for example, is the French art historian Gustave Geoffroy, for one, writing in the early 1890s about his visit to Chelsea. Quoting Geoffroy here, the noise of the crowd expires on the threshold. The fashionable manifestations of sympathy are silenced. In this suburb of London, in this secluded abode, Whistler becomes the self-cloistered hermit the master of a kingdom remote, silent, and strange, peopled by his thoughts and where he reigns, surrounded by the mysterious landscapes he has traversed and which he recreates, and by singular creatures dear to his heart and mind, his familiar friends. In other words, Truffaut is talking about Whistler's landscape paintings and portraits. And here is Octave Moss, critic and secretary of the Belgian avant-garde group Les Vins. Most follows the familiar form of a revelation in the artist's home, which he now describes as a well-lighted studio in Chelsea. And like Geoffroy, most draws a correlation between the painter and the portraits on the studio walls. Most says, Whistler infused into their features and attitudes something of his own superfine nature his psychology shone through on his sitters, transfiguring and elevating them. The atmosphere he wrapped them in was that of his own mind. Like Geoffroy, most goes on then to describe Whistler's studio as a self-created environment populated by the images of the painter's own production, a world that the artist both creates and inhabits. Edmos then performs what may be the ultimate act of contextualization. He suggests that each of Whistler's portraits is, in essence, a self-portrait. So it's to the portraits themselves, the works of art to which these writers seem to be so drawn, that we now need to turn. My purpose here isn't simply to test the validity of the claims made about these portraits in such studio visit accounts against the portrait paintings themselves. Rather, I'm more interested to discover in the visual properties of Whistler's later portraiture an imagery of presentation and withholding that's similar to that of the quote unquote studio visit conceit itself. The trope of the artist secluded in his studio, which we find over and over again in writers like Guisemont, Geoffroy, Moss, many others like them, this is ultimately an image presented for the reader's consumption. It's a rhetorical disengagement that must be engaged with in order for it to have its effect. Reserve and Reticence are not qualities we might readily associate with Whistler, at least not the combative, publicity-seeking side of him. But they are keys to the dynamic I want to identify in his later portraiture, and which symbolist critics extended to their experience of his studio environment. As the literary historian James Adams has recently noted, reserve functions only in a social context. One can be quiet in solitude, but reserve must be displayed. It characterizes a subject in relation to an audience. It's reserve in this sense of the word, then, that informs the symbolist writings about Whistler I've been considering here. And it's a similar reserve, a withdrawal that seeks an audience that further characterizes the portraits these same writers so often were responding to in evoking the artist's studio. There is, in effect, a doubled aspect to Whistler's most distinctive portrait paintings across his career, 
Michael Fried suggests that such a binary structure can be found reflected in the initial critical response to the white girl when it was exhibited in 1863 at the Salon des Refusés. Later retitled Symphony in White No. 1, the work arrested critics with its monumental, nearly monochromatic figure that many writers characterized as entranced, self-absorbed, a sleepwalker, or as Freed summarizes, a figure unaware of being beheld. One author called the painting the portrait of a spirit or a medium, and the French painter Gustave Courbet named it an apparition. As Freed has discovered in contemporary responses, at least one critic further noted that the bearskin upon which Whistler's model stands seems to thrust itself out at the viewer, thus countering the figure's absorption or distraction. This productive tension between the forces of presentation and withdrawal can be traced further and perhaps more clearly in two types of full-length portraiture that Whistler first produced in the 1870s and which continued to evolve in the decades following. And of course, you've already seen this portrait of Frederick Leyland, which represents the first category depicting the male figure elegantly clothed in black and posed before a dark monochromatic background to create a subdued variation of that white on white theme in the symphony in white number one, thus establishing a formula that he followed throughout the next several decades. And of course, I'd encourage you to seek out the original painting upstairs. No PowerPoint image can do the gentleman justice, uh, as good a, an image as this might be. One of the artist's most arresting paintings of the 1890s, for example, is his portrait of the aristocratic French dandy and eccentric, the Comte Robert de Montesquieu Fezensac, this arrangement in black and gold. Both the Leyland and the Montesquieu belong to a species of portraiture that Whistler continued to paint until the end of his life. His painting of George Washington Vanderbilt, for example, begun in 1897, was still in progress when Whistler died in 1903. And here's another picture that you should uh, make a pilgrimage to across the mall in the National Gallery. In each of these paintings then, the dark clad figure and muted background nearly merge into a continuous substance. Display of personality, social station, and accoutrement conventionally associated with portraiture seem threatened by the dissolution of such legibility, and the physical body depicted appears to be at odds with its own disembodiment. But into this enveloping atmosphere, Whistler introduces lighter accents of flesh and fragments of white shirt fronts as conspicuous highlights. If the figure appears to retreat into the surrounding shadowy ambiance, these higher key details seem to advance, producing an image that is at once understated and striking. The second type of Whistler's full-length portraiture offers variations on these themes in the category that the artist appears to have reserved exclusively for female sitters, or more properly speaking, standers. In his Symphony in Flesh, Color, and Pink, Whistler represents Frances Leyland, Frederick's wife, that same decade, he painted Arrangement in Brown and Black, Portrait of Miss Rosa Corder, in which Gustave Geoffroy noted, quote, a disdainful profile, musing that the subject belonged to what he called an extended family of slender, haughty creatures, vivacious but silent, with white hands and secret looks. This female portrait type expresses such haughty secrecy, perhaps even an arrogance, through the distinctive pose Whistler develops here. The figure turns her back to the viewer at the same time that she offers her profile. As he did with the dark male portraits, Whistler continued to explore this posture, which recurs throughout his oeuvre. It can be found again in the fur jacket here of the mid-70s, 
where what I'm calling reserve is further reinforced by a progressive fading of the image toward the hem of the model's garment. And the pose appears in Whistler's work as late as 1900, where he, uh, when he was still painting Mother of Pearl in silver. In each of these examples, from early to late, the characteristic pose fully reveals the model's dress, providing Whistler an occasion to study the finery of fashion artistically displayed as if on a mannequin. At the same time, the glimpse of the figure's face affords the viewer the potential, at least, of making contact with the human subject. The result is a composition that is, once again, slightly at odds with itself, an image that engages the viewer even as it seems to guard itself somewhat from that gaze. At their most fully developed, these two portrait types, male and female, embody what I would like to suggest is a fundamental dynamic in Whistler's art, an art founded on an aesthetic of arrangement and harmony that strives to keep in play a dialogue of opposing tendencies as much as it seeks a resolution of those factors in synthesis. And it's the same kind of character that these symbolist critics I've been referring to here reproduce in their accounts of their visits to Whistler's studio. For the elements of reserve and reclusiveness they want to conjure from Whistler's art to have their effect, they require, of course, a reader. One last example of that female portrait type we've looked at is, I think, especially telling. The composition Whistler arrived at in his arrangement in black, the portrait of Lady Archibald Campbell, inspired a significant amount of critical response. Perhaps not surprisingly, Wiesmann described it as the representation of an elusive figure in retreat. For the French novelist and critic Camille Mauclair, the painting seemed to sum up the whole of Whistler's artistic achievement when he saw the picture in the artist's studio. The entire art of Whistler has retreated beyond the confines of life, Mauclair wrote, and like the portrait of Lady Campbell, regards it from over the shoulder, drawing on its glove somewhat disdainfully before vanishing into the darkness. That was entirely uh, Mauclair's phrasing there. Given such repeated emphasis in the criticism on an artist willfully withdrawn to his studio to recreate that experience in paint, it might hardly be so surprising that Julien Leclerc would have sought a firmer grip on the subject when he produced his quasi-scientific reading of Whistler's palm from a visit to the artist in Paris. And so we move from hard science, you might say, in Carolyn Arscott's previous talk to a more pseudo-scientific kind of interest in what Leclerc is doing in this book. Leclerc describes waiting apprehensively on the threshold of Whistler's studio as he hears the muffled sounds of furniture and picture frames being moved and dragged around the room in response to his knock on the door. He hesitates for a moment before he knocks again, and the door opens slightly to reveal the skeptical face of the artist he's come to see. The Frenchman enters, sets up his camera equipment, and then photographs the palm and the back of his subject's right hand, Whistler's painting hand. And I should note here that of the 30 famous subjects that Leclerc catalogs in this book, Whistler is the only one to receive this front and back treatment. And I welcome anyone's theory as to the ultimate significance of that. And by now, you've, you've also surely noticed the characteristically French spelling or misspelling of the artist's name. Leclerc's careful examination of the hand and his photographic documentation of it provide a basis for interpretation. And in his book, he then proceeds to scrutinize the evidence before him, taking detailed inventory. A firm palm, he notes, even a bit dry, Nimble figure, uh, fingers, rather, with long, slender nails that indicate a great and subtle wit. A long little finger, average thumb, 
a short index finger. This is the hand of a fine, distinguished man, Leclerc deduces, a man whose sharp wit skewers his victims with sarcasm. But then Leclerc admits that such information ultimately has its limitations, and he ends the account of his brief studio encounter with these words. I'm not dwelling on the brilliant and strong qualities of Whistler the artist, Leclerc says, because what makes an artist great or mediocre is due to an intangible element of his makeup, and the man's hand of a substance less subtle and mysterious than his mind isn't subject to these nuances. For the clerk, the artist's hand is the bodily origin of the creative act promised a tantalizing index to the very character of creativity. But scientific study and observation seem able to provide him only with information that in the end confirms the superficial impression of a well-known wit and not the more fundamental access to the artist he may have hoped to explain. Leclerc ultimately acknowledges that any connection between physical demeanor and artistic creation remains elusive. And so we are returned, in a sense, to that more indefinite environment evoked again and again by Leclerc's symbolist colleagues. Other writers of Leclerc's symbolist circle chose to emphasize the very nature of that elusiveness, claiming it as the essential character of both Whistler and his art, to the extent that it seemed to pervade the space within which he worked to produce that art, his studio. These writers labored to put that which was so hard to pin down about Whistler and his work into words, words such as secluded, solitary, secret, retreat, and reserve. Earlier, I quoted James Adams commenting on that last quality, and he's worth listening to again. Reserve functions, Adams says, only in a social context. One can be quiet in solitude, but reserve must be displayed. It characterizes a subject in relation to an audience. It's significant, I think, that here, Adams is writing specifically about Walter Pater. In the aestheticist ambience of his mid-60s studio, the painter's pose, which I mean literally as well as figuratively, is not so very different from the one struck by the artist's model in the 1880s. And so I want to suggest that the presentational strategies that I've been focusing on here in a symbolist context surely have some important implications for how we might think about comparable aspects of aestheticism as we continue to seek ways to place Whistler in relation to the studio and beyond. Thank you.